My name is Felicity Barringer. I'm the writer in residence at Stanford's Bill Lane Center for the American West. And we are the hosts, uh, we are very lucky to be the hosts of this presentation by Maria McBarish. And Maria, who is coming to us all the way from Marin, uh, is, she's somebody who's just hard to introduce. Usually you like to introduce people with a succinct title, like a law professor, a musician, a historian, a journalist. But Maria McFarish doesn't make introductions easy at all because she's hard to fit into a single mold. She's an architect. She's an historian. She's a parser of literary themes and theories. And she's an anthropologist. Maybe the easiest thing to say is just Maria is polymath. As an architect, she takes a vision of what might happen and makes it practical and real. And in her other skills, she takes what's practical and real and works backwards to find out the original vision and then to tell that story. She's got a PhD and a half from Stanford, the major part in modern thought and literature, the minor part in anthropology. She has three degrees from Berkeley, two of them in architecture and one in design and visual studies. And she's been a graduate fellow here at the Lane Center, which has been very lucky for us. She's been a lecturer in architecture at Berkeley and for five years a professor at the California College of Arts and Sciences in San Francisco. So rather than try to tell her story, I'll let her tell her own. Maria, over to you. Well, thank you, Felicity. I should just say that was the California College of Arts and Crafts because they're kind of touchy about that. Um, and somehow I managed to put in actually 15 or 16 years there, believe it or not. Um, but that was an outstanding introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you for moderating today. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude to Bruce Kane and Iris Wee for inviting me to do this talk and to Marco Martinez and Stephanie Burbank for coordinating. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm an architect and a spatial historian. That's how I think of myself mostly. Um, <clears throat> I like studying history because it helps me understand why things are the way they are. And as a designer, I also enjoy thinking about the durability of plans and schemes over time. Today, I'm going to talk about some long term effects of 19th century railroad development in a place called Cape Hay Valley, California. I'm going to argue that residents of Cape Hay are living today in a future conceived indirectly by Leland Stanford and his associates. In this and other ways, Cape Hay Valley is like a lot of rural areas in, in, the, in the American West. So now that might all seem like a tall order for a half hour Zoom talk, but I wanna kick things off by introducing a dimension of this history, which I won't be talking about directly. And that is Native American history, or rather Native American presence. It's not a topic that's often paired with railroad development, but given the reckoning that our country is currently undergoing over longstanding and pernicious racial injustices, I wanna invite you to practice a certain kind of integrative thinking while you listen to me. You may find it difficult to hold in mind the Native American population of the West Coast when the topic at hand ostensibly involves only Anglo and Euro-American ideas of property and progress. So to assist you, I'm going to provide some context for the local railroad history that you're about to hear. I'd like you to imagine the longer arc of settlement in California as a kind of palimpsest with indigenous inhabitation as its baseline. This is a map created by anthropologist Alfred Krober that shows the distinctive linguistic zones of indigenous peoples around 1770, just before the Spanish mission era began. By most estimates, between three and 400,000 people lived here and mainly in the Northern zones. These red dots represent the extent of Indian reservations in 1860 and Cape Hay Valley is in that black circle. The Krober map appears in ghost form to show the extent of reduction in Indian territories from pre-missionary times to the post gold rush period. Note that in less than a hundred years, about 90% of the population has dropped from between three and 400,000 people to only about 30,000. Causes of this demographic decline included disease, 
warfare, starvation, dislocation, changes in cultural forms, the reordering of native institutions, especially the structure of the Indian family, and other influences and impacts of European culture, including the ones that tried to make Indians dependent on whites. Now I'm going to mostly stop being explicit about Native American presence for the remainder of this talk. But my challenge to you, again, is for you to try to hold the indigenous residents of Cape Valley in mind, even if I don't talk about them directly. This map was created in 1860 by the US Surveyor General. As you can see, large areas remain blank, awaiting the surveyor's reconnaissance. And again, I've added that black circle to indicate the area that I'm gonna be focusing on going forward, which is Cape Valley, which is in West Yolo County. If we zoom in, you can see the contrast between Mexican era land grant parcels, which appear irregular here and have darker outlines, and the grid system used to divide and allocate lands by the US Surveyor General. The rancho land grants of the Mexican era tended to follow natural boundaries like waterways, valleys, and mountains, which accounts for their irregular shapes. In 1846, the entire Cape Valley, along with a good portion of the floodplain that extends from its main waterway, was granted to three brothers, Santiago, Nemicio, and Francisco Belleza. And I've highlighted the, their rancho grant in green here. Unfortunately, the Berriesa brothers didn't have a lot of time to do anything with this land because by the time they secured title, Euro-American settlers were already arriving in the Cape Bay area to claim ranch lands for themselves. Remember that California was admitted to the United States in 1848, and so that was just two years after this land grant was formalized with the Mexican government. <clears throat> so let me uh, situate the Cape Bay Valley for you in today's geography. It's about an hour and a half northeast of San Francisco by car. And what you're looking at is a Google Earth view with the old land grant parcel outlined in orange. Um, it's on the west edge of the Sacramento Valley, extending into the coastal range about 20 miles or so. And Cache Creek is the waterway that, that runs through it, basically from the northwest end out to the southeast and beyond eventually to the Sacramento River. Here's what Cape Bay Valley looks like today. And here's what it looked like at the uh, end of the 19th century. On the surface, you might say that it hasn't changed that much, but in fact, the railroad boosters that created pastoral images of Cape Bay Valley in the 19th century, like these ones, had a lot to do with the quality of the community and the kind of farming that distinguish the area today. So let me back up now and talk a little bit about how and why the railroad came to Cape Bay Valley in the first place. During the Civil War, in order to expedite settlement and development of the Western territories, Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. In addition to offering railroad companies long-term deferred interest loans, the act provided a subsidy of 12,800 acres of federal land for every mile of track that was laid. The companies were granted alternating parcels in a checkerboard arrangement extending out from their tracks. If the land they passed through was already owned, the company was entitled to take parcels further afield. Needless to say, the value of the parcels nearest to the station and, and track would appreciate faster in value due to their de facto accessibility by train. Of course, among the primary beneficiaries of the Pacific Railroad Act were these men, the so-called Big Four, um, including Leland Stanford, co-founder of Stanford University, Collis Huntington, Charles Crocker, and Mark Hopkins. They had started the Central Pacific Railroad Company in the early 1860s to build the western portion of the first transcontinental road, which was ultimately completed in 1869. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the stories of these men, except to note that a small holding company that they purchased in 1868, the Southern Pacific Railroad Company, would in 1870 merge with the Central Pacific, which as you remember was their main company, and eventually in 1885, absorb the Central Pacific more or less completely. So by the late 1880s, the Southern Pacific had achieved a mega monopoly of transportation 
in California and beyond. But that's not to say that the Southern Pacific was entirely stable or profitable in its operations, as Stanford historian Richard White has demonstrated in his epic book, Railroaded. The real means by which they made profit were um, their subsidiary companies for which the Pacific Improvement Company functioned as a kind of umbrella after 1878. The Pacific Imbru Improvement Company in turn owned and oversaw tertiary companies like the Cape Valley Land Company. What, or rather who, was the Cape Valley Land Company? Well, I was able to find their articles of incorporation in the Stanford University archives, and uh, this is a photograph of the signatures of the directors. And once I had their names, I was able to do a little research and created this social network diagram overlooking for the time being the intermediary Pacific Improvement Company in order to highlight direct connections between the big floor, four players at the top and these directors of the Cape Valley Land Company. So a couple of the, these men were the sons of the original big four associates, including the fellow on the far right, Timothy Hopkins was the adopted son of Mark Hopkins. And the guy in the center, Charles Crocker was the, Charles F. Crocker was the son of Charles Crocker Sr. But others like E.H. Miller, who's the person um, from second from the right, and sorry, I wasn't able to find a photograph of him. Um, others like him were both personal friends of the big four and uh, often like um, sort of officers of very large subsidiaries like the Pacific Improvement Company, which was the parent company of the Cape Valley Land Company, or in Miller's case, he was the secretary and controller of the Central Pacific Company. Um, so I think you can start to see how complicated and sort of ingrown these relationships were. And I do think that the Cape Valley Land Company, as one of just many subsidiaries of the Southern Pacific, is a good example of how the company kept operations close, um, even as it grew its empire in order to ensure that corporate profits would run through friendly circuits and probably ultimately back to the main players. So why did the Southern Pacific and the Pacific Improvement Company and in turn the Cape Valley Land Company think that it was a good idea to bring train service to Cape Valley? During the 1870s and 1880s, the Southern Pacific put a good deal of effort into building up their road network within the quite broad territories that they controlled at that time, ostensibly in order to increase their customers. So um, <clears throat> prior to this period, they were focused on really expanding the road network outward and it eventually grew to cover the whole territory from Oregon, basically down the West Coast across the Southwest, including parts of Mexico and Texas, all the way to New Orleans. So that was a period of expansion outward. And this period in the 1880s was more of a time of branching in. Of course, company executives were also motivated by opportunities to leverage the railroad's effect on property values, as I hinted, as I hinted earlier, through regional land development schemes. The Cape Valley, a sleepy ranching and grain farming area in Central California, seemed to have what they were looking for insofar as it was underdeveloped in their eyes. By 1877, an of investors had already built a line from Vacaville off of the Central Pacific's main route between Sacramento and the Bay Area up to a town called Madison. So that orange arrow uh, is pointing to the location of this town, Madison. So this track was pre-existing and it was built by, by a company that wasn't the Southern Pacific. And so it presented an opportunity for them uh, when they went to purchase it to move the, the line directly on up into the Cape Valley because Madison is basically just uh, west of the, of the entrance to Cape Bay. So the Cape Bay Valley Land Company was incorporated in 1887, 10 years after this track was built. And that was in anticipation of the Southern Pacific purchasing that existing road under Leland Stanford's direction. So Leland Stanford was the president of the Southern Pacific at the time. During that 10 year interval, 
Between the completion of the depot at Madison and its extension into Cape Valley, Chancel Patwin Indians tried to adapt to a rapidly changing circumstance, preserving as best they could their seasonal movement between traditional settlement spots. And the reason I know this is because a local historian, Ada Murhoff, transcribed the 1931 reminiscences of a white pioneer's child, which date back to this period. So I'm gonna read just a little excerpt from those remin reminiscences. Um, and re just bear in mind, this is filtered through the perspective of a white man, an older man looking back on his childhood, and he's the son of a white pioneer. One of my earliest recollections is seeing the great string of Indians passing through as they came over from Berryessa, where they had a big rancheria. There was another rancheria in our pasture, back of the house about 300 yards. The Indians stopped over there on their trip to Grimes, where they had still another of their rancherias. They always came through in the fall. After the threshing was done, for that was before the days of harvesters, the Indians went around from ranch to ranch and cleaned the stack bottoms for half of the grain there." Unquote. Maria, there's no image on the screen. There you go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was meant to be black. Meanwhile, the Cape Valley Land Company was approaching landowners in the area and buying up large tracts. As the Pacific Improvement Company prepared to build the rail lines and depots between Madison and the north end of the Cape Valley, the land company began designing towns and subdividing farms. And what you're looking at here is a blueprint of the subdivision map created by the Cape Valley Land Company in 1877 or 78. Um, and I found that in the Stanford University archives. How did they decide which parcels to buy and how to locate and plan the towns and depots? Well, broadly, I think there were three main criteria. The first being obviously where land was available to buy. And I don't know too much about um, that in any detail, except to say that California statewide was still more or less enjoying this period of the Gilded Age um, economically, but Cape Valley itself was experiencing an economic depression. So I think it wouldn't have been too difficult for the land company to persuade landowners there to sell lands to them. The other two factors um, I do know a little bit more about, and those would be the logistics of uh, train location and what we might call market capture. Uh, so train service and, and then market capture. And then the, the other being uh, the social and political agenda of project stakeholders. So I'm, let me delve into those two a bit more. Logistically speaking, the Southern Pacific designed its road system to maximize the efficiency of car movement and minimize the cost of transport. To some extent, they located stations, depots, and divisional points in relation to what already existed, attempting in this way to tap and grow the base of customers. So for example, if there was already a town, they might try to put a station there or they might try to completely circumvent it so they could start a new town and, and you know, benefit for the, for the real estate transactions that would result from that. The market capture criterion was to a large extent a question of math. Eight miles was the maximum distance at which a farmer could make a round trip with a wagon load of grain or produce on a level terrain in a single day, according to historian Richard White, and I'm quoting him here. A farmer along the line halfway between stations would still be able to make his journey and be back by dark, unquote. Train servicing facilities like section houses, water tanks, and warehouses would be needed every second station or so, roughly speaking. So this combined with those factors like whether there was an existing town and what the maximum travel distance of a farmer would be were the, the primary sort of practical considerations for the mostly the Pacific Improvement Company in, in terms of how it located its station points. So this map was created in 1891, which was just a couple of years after train service began operating into Cape Valley. And I've highlighted the train's path in orange there. Um, so let me just show you how this rolls out on the ground, so to speak. Basically, as I said, 
by 1877, there was this uh, pre-existing track and town and station in Madison. And then in a very short period of time, really just a period of months in, in the year of 1888, all of these towns were created uh, by the railroad company and the track was laid as well. Tancred, there was a station that was placed there, but the town itself didn't come until a couple years later. So that was a very, very rapid transformation in the valley. I think you can see how each of these new station points falls pretty easily within that farmer's eight mile range as well. All right, so having covered, you know, some of the logistical considerations for new roads and stations, I'm going to say a few words about the social and political agenda behind this particular development scheme, because so far everything that I've said about the Southern Pacific's business strategies could apply to almost any region uh, in the rural West and specifically any of, those, of their initiatives in rural areas. But KP Valley became something of a special project for the railroad company, largely because of the interests and influence of this man, William H. Mills. Mills was the chief land agent for the Southern Pacific and Central Pacific Railroad Companies and a close friend of Collis Huntington. In terms of his development vision, vision he also found an ally in Leland Stanford and other uh, Southern Pacific associates. They believed that rural densification and what they called scientific farming were crucial to solving the social and economic challenges of their, of their times. They wanted what we might call a republic of micro farms in which farmers brought a sense of terroir to the market. Thanks in large part to their efforts, railroad transportation had rapidly brought every corner of the United States within reach, making possible an unprecedented degree of exchange. Mills and the associates felt that producers should maximize the potential of their circumstances through regional specialization and the Cape Valley they felt could serve as a sort of land policy laboratory uh, in support of that aim. So as editor of a newspaper with one of the widest circulations in the West at the time, W.H. Mills was perfectly positioned to advance this cause. Within months following the land company's incorporation, he began advertising their designs for Cape. Then as railroad operations were set to start in the summer of 1888, he launched a massive promotional campaign. This is the June 14th, 1888 issue of his newspaper, the Sacramento Daily Record Union, which as I said, had a very large circulation at the time. The entire front page and about half of the rest of the issue were dedicated to the breaking news that Cape Valley was a small farmer's paradise and a sure bet as settlement opportunities went with parcels made affordable to the little man through company financing. Mills and his colleagues promulgated the Jeffersonian ideal of a Yemen Republican society predicated on land ownership and individual industry. Its unit, however, was neither the 400 or so acres that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson called for, nor yet the 160 acres afforded to white men by the 1862 Homestead Act. No, Thanks to the railroad company, all that was needed in a place like Cape Valley, they felt, would be 10 or 20 acres of land per family. The soil and climate, combined with the availability of trains for distribution, meant that farmers could cultivate more lucrative fruits and vegetables and get them to markets near and far before similar produce would ripen elsewhere. And this was a particular advantage that they saw Cape Valley as having. The land company presented Cape Valley as a model for the future of farming. They designed communities of smallholders, places where crop specialization and crop diversification would give farmers an edge in the market. They wanted to create a region where distribution collectives and water management would help farmers succeed as well. In some parts of the valley, they experimented with additional social agendas like cooperative colonies, immigrant settlements and temperance zones where selling or drinking alcohol would be prohibited. Mills had an extra 20,000 copies of his special issue of the Record Union published and distributed across the Eastern United States and all the way to Europe. 
He also placed extensive advertisements and quote unquote news stories about Cape Valley in newspapers everywhere. So I'm gonna read a quote from one of the news stories from that special edition of the Record Union, just to give you a sense of the, the, the level of passion and vision that, that the, um, the land company brought to the project. And I'm quite sure that this was written by W.H. Mills himself. We consider the announcement of the opening of this prolific valley to small settlement, according to a well-matured and carefully adjusted scheme as having specially important and direct relation to the populating and developing of the whole state. From the fact that it is the first practical and entirely feasible effort made in Central California to locate and put into immediate agricultural industry a large community of small land cultivators or to devote themselves mainly to fruit and vine growing. And the author goes on to add that out of this industry of small land cultivators are to spring social and industrial conditions conducive to the higher states of civilization and prolific of the conservative stable communities of independent and self-reliant homes." Unquote. The Southern Pacific organized excursion trains into Cape Valley for prospective buyers. The land company held a festive auction of lots in the main town of Esperanza, which later was um, known by the name Esparto, that's its name currently, where they offered a free sit down dinner in the train station. So I think that gives you a sense of the, the, the sort of media blitz and promotional efforts of Mills and his land company associates. I wanna to try to give you an overview of how they, they attempted to implement this vision for re Republican rural densification. To begin with, they subdivided the parcels they sold into very small units, relatively speaking, starting as small as two acres, but with most between 20 or 30 acres. They clustered the smallest parcels together near the depots to create a town-like sense of community. They also limited the number of parcels an individual or a company could buy to thwart any uh, real estate speculators from, from horning in. So I think they really just wanted farmers to commit to the, to the vision that they had for the area. They jump-started crop diversification and horticultural experimentation in the area by pre-planting some of the parcels. They offered very favorable financing terms with only 10 or 20% down payments required initially and the balance not, to, not due until the fifth anniversary uh, so that farmers only had to pay a modest annual interest while they were getting their orchards and crops set up. And I think that's significant because it shows that the company itself was fairly invested in the success of this, of this project because if the farmers had not been profitable enough to pay back the, or to pay the balloon payment at the end of that five-year term, the company would have lost a certain opportunity as well. They required uh, that buyers plant fruit trees as a condition of purchase, but in some cases they waived this requirement if the buyer would agree in writing to abide their sort of modern ideas about horticulture. They also used covenants and deed restrictions to, attack, to uh, establish colonies of small hold farmers who would support each other in the planting, harvesting, and distribution of their crops. And this was especially the case in that town called Tancred. The colony parcels were promoted more intensively and offered for sale first. And finally, they supported all of these initiatives through physical infrastructure. So building roads, bridging rivers, promoting irrigation systems, and so on, but also through what you might call social infrastructure, which included things like grange halls, parks, hotels, and even a temperance reading room at the north end of the valley um, in, term in uh, Rumsey. So I think that kind of gives you an overview of what the Southern Pacific's kind of corporate interest or motivation was for branching into places like the Cape Valley. And also, I hope it gives you a little bit more of a sense of the nuanced specific plans that the land company had for this area. In the interest of saving time, 
I decided to compress the next hundred years of history into one slide. This is a timeline uh, with time on the horizontal axis and the vertical uh, representing, let's say, quality of life or failures and gains. What it shows is that the dreams of WH Mills and the Cape Bay Valley Land Company were only realized partially in fits and starts and never very successfully. So uh, as you can see, there was an initial boom, but that was mostly, uh, you know, in the early 1890, that was mostly the result of their land sales and construction efforts. But unfortunately, nationally, there was a, a, an economic panic in 1893, which affected the Yolo County and the Cape Bay Valley just as much. And while the rest of the country, country started to recover around 1896, unfortunately, farmers in the Cape Bay Valley were uh, the victims of a very bad winter freeze and it killed most of the orchards. So there were ups and downs all the way through the, the next century. The world wars were generally good for farmers. The depression was particularly bad uh, for Cape Bay Valley, I think. So without going into too much detail, but I can answer if anyone has questions about, I do know a bit more about this. I want to just say that I think that the railroad had a big part of the, the overall kind of um, mostly downward uh, movement of the line of uh, fate in Cape Bay Valley, um, because it was never, as it turned out, very successful at, or financially for the railroad company to operate into that branch. Um, and that meant that they, the Southern Pacific, and mostly for other reasons too, because the, the Southern Pacific was not viable as a business in its own right. Um, it was teetering on bankruptcy in the 1890s. It was taken over by another group in the early 20th century. And ultimately it was decided that it just wasn't uh, worthwhile to continue railroad service into Cape Pay. So railroad service sort of declined and by the mid 1930s, they actually withdrew operations altogether and removed the track in the Cape Bay Valley. Um, they kept uh, passenger and freight service going for a little while to Esparta, which is that gateway town. But in 1957, they stopped passenger service and in 1975, they stopped freight service. So uh, for farmers who were struggling to eke out a living in Cape Bay Valley, um, automobile and truck transport sort of picked up the slack um, and that made things, um, you know, sustainable for a period of time. But by the mid 1970s, some family farms were really struggling and were basically really ready to give up um, and that made it possible, I think, for a new generation of young farmers to come in and start renting and then eventually purchasing land there. And they were interested in organic farming. So you had a handful of people in the mid 1970s trying out their hands in organic farming. They were joined by others in the 1980s and 90s and onward to the point where I think that Cape Bay Valley is best known today for the organic produce that, that it grows. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up this, this presentation now with some thoughts on how 19th century railroad development affects Cape Bay Valley today, in my view. Basically, I think that the underlying conditions needed to make the visionary scheme of those railroad associates and WH Mills sustainable over time were simply not in place during this period between the late 1880s and 1970s. I've studied this area and its railroad history for several years now. And until this month, as I prepared to give this talk today, I could see only the negative hollowing effects of the railroad's big plans in the ensuing uh, century, especially in towns like Esparto. And I haven't really talked much about Esparto in this presentation, but if anyone's interested, I gave a longer talk about it specifically in connection with the same history at the Lane Center Working Group in April. And so I think there's a recording of that on the Lane Center's website. So basically I was, I thought that it was a disappointed vision. But then I had this idea a couple weeks ago when I was looking back at that blueprint of the subdivision map, uh, the scroll that you saw earlier, to try to overlay 
it directly onto satellite maps. Um, so I used Photoshop to do this. And I was just interested to see if there was any, any traces of that original kind of set of ideas inscribed in the landscape as it's farmed today. And I was surprised to see that there was a lot of resonance. So it got me interested in pursuing it further, which um, entailed basically getting more information from the assessor's office about parcel sizes and parcel history, and then looking up where the organic farms are located in the, in the Cape Bay Valley today, how big they are, um, and so on. And so here's, um, let me introduce you to the organic farmers of Cape Bay Valley. You're looking at photographs of just a handful of them. Um, and then there's a list, I hope it's more comprehensive on the left. So this is, this is the community of organic farmers that has been, that's established itself really in the last 20, 30, 40 years in some cases. So this is what I learned. First of all, the Cape Bay Valley Land Company only developed less than a fifth of the total, you know, sort of farmable, former rancho portion of the Cape Bay Valley proper. And uh, so that's just a small part of the, the overall region. I also learned that, to, to my surprise, that only, as far as I can tell, about five and a half percent of that same overall Cape Bay Valley rancho area is farmed organically right now, even though I think their, their reputation far outweighs that proportion. The thing that surprised me though, most of all, is that it turns out, as far as I can tell again, that about 90% of those organic farms are located on former Cape Bay Valley land parcels. So land company parcels. So that is a sort of astonishing correlation in my mind, because you'll probably remember from that scroll that the Cape Bay Valley land company parcels were not all in one place. They're kind of spread around. And also when you realize that, that, that they only had a kind of minority portion of the Valley real estate, it's really surprising to me anyway that these organic found, farms found their way to those places. So the inference that I draw from that, tentatively at least, is that the land policies, subdivision strategies, and social priorities of the Cape Bay Valley Land Company have proven consequential in the very, very long term. So this is that summary that I showed you earlier of the land company's 1888 agenda for Cape Bay Valley. I think that virtually all of these aims have been realized by contemporary organic farmers in Cape Bay with the possible exception of unanimous sobriety. Maybe it's not surprising that organic farmers in general seem to share many of the Cape Bay Valley land company's priorities and principles but that doesn't explain how W.H. Mills and his colleagues were able to formulate them so long ago, because these were quite radical ideas in the 19th century. Another thing that I don't yet know, but which I think is even more compelling, at least to me, is exactly how the land itself carries that vision forward from the 19th century. Because I'm pretty sure that these organic farmers didn't know all the details or probably even the general story of what the land company was trying to do there when they were trying to choose where to start their farms and grow them. So I'm going to leave off there um, in a way with a bigger question than an answer um, and I'll open it up for discussion and I'm also going to put my email address up here in case anyone wants to reach out uh, because I'd love to hear from you if you have thoughts or questions about any of this. So thank you very much. Maria, thank you. That was just fascinating and uh, taught me things I thought I, 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 thought I had uh, learned a lot from the last time you gave a lecture just in the Lane Center and you've taught me a whole bunch more. Um, as everybody who can see this screen probably knows, but just in case, at the bottom there is a question and answer tag. And if you put a question in there, I will be gathering them and we'll try to ask them, but also I will be opening this up to, to questions, including those, those questions that you're putting in that, uh, in that space um, after I ask a couple of questions of my own. So uh, just in general, Maria, I am again impressed. It's a fascinating granular 
vision of history and of plant communities, which I basically thought were something that existed uh, in the East and, uh, you know, places like Howard, uh, in Howard County, Maryland and things. Uh, but I'm seeing that the idea of planning communities goes back at least a couple hundred years, if not uh, many more centuries before that. But when you're talking about history, inevitably history follows a certain arc. And the railroads and the land planners and mills obviously created an arc that uh, has still affects uh, Cape Valley. But if they had not existed, can you give me an alternative history, how the arc would have been different if uh, either, if it, had, uh, if it had just been European settlers uh, coming in on their own uh, without the help of the railroad? Would we have gotten to this point or would we be somewhere else? Okay, wow. That's so, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I mean, that's, I guess that's, that's the, the, the question I'm kind of begging as well in this whole approach to studying the area because um, I do feel that the, the Southern Pacific's work there was very consequential. And it's, it's possible that if, if they hadn't come in, then another railroad would have come in eventually. Um, and that would have been probably the, the result of more of a, a sense of demand, like that there would be a, a market for the railroad as opposed to the Southern Pacific's need to feed its own machine, so to speak, by, by branching in and building up its customer base. So it would have been, um, it's possible there could have still been a railroad history there, but it probably would have been a quite different uh, sort of dynamic in terms of how it, supported the farmers. Um, but if there had been no railroad history, it's really interesting to think about because part of, you know, obviously what the land company was about was buying up very large parcels and subdividing them and then, you know, adding these additional sort of um, priorities in how they implemented the and sold these, these, um, these towns or planned farming areas. So if that hadn't happened, if the subdividing hadn't happened, there might still be quite large parcels of land there, which in turn could mean that there would have been, you know, I guess potentially the risk that like what was happening in the Central Valley during the late 20th century, where a big agro business was coming in and sort of making larger and larger and larger farms um, by, by joining parcels together. That could have happened in Cape Valley. I think the fact that all those parcels were subdivided already would have made pretty much um, fended off, you know, some of that that trend, that sort of Monsanto kind of industry farming. Okay. So that maybe makes what they did a safeguard. Um, but you know, there's there's so many other ways to look at it. Like, you know, the Southern Pacific and, and Central Pacific were subsidized by the federal government, and so another big question in my mind would be like stepping out of the Cape Valley, you know, what, what if those taxpayer funds had been allocated differently so that instead of eventually lining the pockets of men like Leland Stanford and Carlos Huntington, they were put to some more public use. So I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question to sort of think about because there's so many possibilities and so many implications as well. Um, when a question of my own to follow that up, but also to, to blend in with some of the questions that are coming in the Q&A, is there any of the land holding left in the Cape Bay Valley from any company that's a descendant of the original, uh, you know, Southern Pacific Railroad subsidiaries? Uh, and when you're talking about what you thought happened before you kind of reevaluated it just in the last couple of weeks, what did you mean by a hollowing out of the <laughs> Okay. Um, first of all, there are there are descendants of both of um, people who came in that period as a result of the promotional efforts of Mills and his associates, so land company like buyers. There are still families that um, have stayed in business in the valley. There's not probably a lot of them, but they're they're there. And there are also, I think, some 
descendants of people who predate that group. So some of the original pioneer families are still around. So there's, it's a really tremendous mix. Um, and this, the fact that there's this kind of long history of farming there, I think gives it a certain stability in a way as an agricultural area. Um, what was your second question again? It was a, oh, the, the second question was, what do you mean by hollowing out? Oh, hollowing out, yeah. Um, I mean by that, that the, you know, basically this, the railroad company built not just the track and these towns, but a kind of, um, in a way like a scaffold for society there. And, and that was the, you know, their sort of micro farm republic. Um, but it, it, so it was as much a sort of social scaffold as it was a physical scaffold. And all of that was really consequential. You know, it really, the people bought that dream and they settled in and they gave it their all. And some people made it and a lot of people didn't. And they were really dependent, not just on the, the value and merit of that dream surviving, but also on the support of the railroad company. It was like a contract that they were, that they were uh, agreeing to, not just for the purchase of the land, but to have the opportunity to sell their produce and to, to use the railroad as a way of getting goods and, and stuff in, in, in the other direction. So they needed supplies. Um, in the valley. And so when the railroad company withdrew, it wasn't just that they lacked the physical, you know, support, but the whole dream that that hinged on that scaffold to mix metaphors a little bit was was kind of it started to implode. So I my sense today is that some of well, especially areas like Esparto and some of the areas that are struggling more are still kind of bound up in this history of railroad design. Um, and it's taking time and it's taking community effort, which is certainly happening, to kind of untangle and redirect it. And I think, you know, in a, in a sort of unplanned way, the organic farming movement there is, is actually benefiting from that scaffolding and repurposing it. So that's kind of what I mean. That's great. And in the, the slide of 100 years, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. But uh, just two things, both my questions and some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Indian tribes and the success that bingo and gambling gave them and how that changed relations with the community? Yeah, it's a very interesting story. and, and um, I'm glad you asked that. So I won't, there's just, there's so much information that I could try to relay, but I'm going to try and keep it brief. But if, as you say, in that slide, I showed that Indians were barely subsisting, barely surviving, like really struggling under circumstances of grinding poverty in the valley, um, while a lot of the farmers were struggling as well, but at a sort of different level socioeconomically. But then in the mid 18 or 1980s, they did start a bingo parlor which was immediately successful. And then the Indian Gaming Act was passed in 18, 1988. Um, and they were able to uh, expand their operations. So basically their socioeconomic status, you know, kind of went through the roof in a really uh, short period of time. And whereas they had been, uh, I would say probably Neglected maybe is a benign word, you know, in terms of how what happened with them before that in the valley. Um, all of a sudden, they were very wealthy, much wealthier ultimately than most of the farmers, and they had a tremendous amount of influence and power because, as you probably know, um, Indian tribes, if they're federally recognized, have a certain degree of sovereignty and aren't bound by the same laws uh, locally that, that other residents of the Valley would be. So they could do things like expand their casino operations and grow them with or without the community's um, you know, permission or, or goodwill. And so initially that, that I think created a, a kind of conflict because not just because of the reversal of power relations, but because infrastructure was really stressed by the increased traffic in the area. So that meant like 
way more people on the roads, different kinds of people, people driving faster, more dangerously, but also like water resources were threatened or, or, or tapped and uh, you know, s sheriff services, fire services, all that kind of stuff were strained. And um, that could have gone very badly. And initially, I think it didn't go too well between the tribe that rightfully was becoming, you know, uh, financially independent of, uh, of the agencies that had been supporting them before. Um, and the farmers who, you know, were already struggling to hang in there uh, with those same resources. So what happened though, which I think is really exceptional, is that at a certain point fairly early on, after the conflict and tension had been kind of growing, uh, the farmers and, and, the, and a few representatives from the tribal council of the, the Native American group um, came together and had a whole long series of meetings and conversations and grew out from a core, a core constituency, like a handful of people who started that work um, into a larger kind of um, ultimately a nonprofit group that, that represents a very wide cross section of stakeholders there. And together they are working out and have been for some time, a shared vision for what they want in the Valley and what they believe and understand the history to be there and what they want going forward. So it's a really interesting example and I think potentially a good model for areas where specifically, you know, Indian gaming introduces a radical rapid change in an area. This is, it is just fascinating. Just a couple of other very quick questions from, from the queue. Um, one is, did the Southern Pacific Line connect growers directly, this is way back in the 19th century, to processors such as grain mills and storage elevators in woodland, or was there any of that infrastructure, grain mills, storage elevators, elevators already in the Capay Valley? And how much was, I would just add, how much was the valley interdependent in those uh, early years of farming with other communities outside? Yeah, cool. great question. Um, well, actually, Esparto has had and, and still has some warehouses that where grain was stored and processed and stuff and um, unfortunately the the line never connected directly with woodland there was a whole group in woodland of, of um, business people and boosters who wanted to make that connection because that would have been a natural link and there were far more facilities available you know at least in the short term there so um, they tried, uh, they lobbied, they wanted, the railroad company decided they weren't going to pay for it. And that wasn't unusual. Uh, if local, if there was enough local interest, a lot of times the local um, business people would get the funds together to build a track. But anyway, that didn't happen. So I think Esparto would have been the main um, kind of station point. There were other, I think there was at least two other depots, I'm not exactly sure within the Cape Valley itself, but I'm not sure how much they had in terms of uh, grain warehouses or produce warehouses. Um, so the infrastructure was, was like the local infrastructure would have been probably Esparto and then Madison had some warehouses too, I think. And then I'll make this the, the last question, I think. Is there um, a model to be found either in terms of the economic development in the Capay Valley in the last 20 years with the organic farming or in the social development with the different groups and, and uh, factions within the community coming together. Is that a model that could be reproduced elsewhere and can it last in Capay Valley? I mean, to the extent that these, that the, that my neighbors there and you know the, the the farmers and Indians have put so much time into building and reinforcing that relationship and it's an ongoing project. I, I think I have good confidence that they can sustain it and, and strengthen it still more going forward. Um, it's not to say that's easy work but I do have um, a good deal of confidence in what they've done and will do. Um, I think that yes, that is an interesting model. I don't know how they would um, kind of break it down and and, and sort of share it, because um, so much of it is just you know sitting down 
face to face back when we were able to be in person and having conversations about things that you have in common, you know, um, as opposed to things that you're afraid of or things that are changing that you don't like. So I think that um, it would be interesting if I know KP Valley Vision, the nonprofit that was formed, probably has thought about this and possibly does have a kind of um, a set of ideas that that could be reproducible in other contexts. But mostly the, the really sort of important um, consideration here is that it was the Indian Gaming Act and ultimately the governor of California's uh, well, the voters of California um, kind of confirmed that Indian gaming was okay with them in the 90s. So the Gaming Act happened nationally in 88, but 99 was when California voters approved it. And very quickly, the governor um, also entered into negotiations with the with the tribe there, the Yoka de Hewintun tribe. So um, it's the reversal, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of upending of the structural uh, kind of suppression of certain people in favor of others that is remarkable here. And that isn't something that's likely to happen or at least it's difficult to make happen um, outside of this, this sort of special legal status that Native Americans have and deserve. And so, if we can find other ways to upend those kinds of structural uh, sort of entrenched power relations to force people to the table and have those conversations, I think that would, that it is a good model, but I just wonder how we could do that. And maybe the Indian Gaming Act for that community could be a good model for reparations in other communities. So I don't know, but it's a, it's a great thing to think about. Maria, this has just been wonderful. If you could look at the uh, at the chat and the Q and A's, uh, you're seeing a lot of compliments there, and they're well deserved. Thank you so much for bringing us this history and for letting us understand a little bit of what the railroad wanted and then what it got and what we got as a result. Thank you so much. Really wonderful. Thank you, and thank you everybody for coming. Stay well.